it's my pleasure to introduce Major Gaurav Aryaji. Major Gaurav Aryaji is a well-known defense analyst and the host of the popular TV series Patriot. He completed his graduation from St. Stephen's in 92, and in 93, he joined the Officers' Training Academy, Madras. He graduated in 94 and was commissioned into the 17th Battalion, the Kumau Regiment. He left the Indian Army in 1999 and later completed his MBA. He's worked at prestigious companies such as HCL, Vodafone, Wipro, Ernst & Young. His last tenure was with the Smart Group, a Singapore-based MNC. Major Gaurav Arya was the CEO of Steria Infratech Limited, a construction company that was part of the Smart Group. Later, he was the president of uh, the conglomerate. He's a keen writer whose work has been enthusiastically followed on social media, and he's a thought leader to say the least. Major Gaurav Arya is also a public speaker and has given several motivational talks and is a TEDx speaker. It's my privilege to welcome him on stage, sir. Jai Hind. It was the 12th of September, 1897, Afghanistan. And there were two forts and a small mud fortress. One was Fort Golistan and the other was Fort Havelock. But during those times, there was no electrical communication. There were no mobile phones, there were no radio sets, there was nothing absolutely. And in those times, they said that we must have a small fort in between so that Gulistan and Havelock can speak amongst ourselves. And how did they speak? They had smoke, they had mirrors, and they used to signal using smokes and mirrors. The fort in between these forts, the small mud fortress, that was called Saragari. The topic of my lecture is what we can learn from the armed forces. And today, I'm going to tell you a small little story. This is the story of Saragari. This is the story of 21 Sikh soldiers who died fighting all night. 21 against 10,000 Afghans. This is a true story. This is not something out of a movie or a comic book. This actually happened. And they say that this is the greatest last stand in the history of military warfare. The Afghans attacked the fort and they told the Sikhs, we do not have enmity with you. We're fighting the British. The British are ruling India. Why are you fighting for the British? And the Sikhs told them, we're not fighting for the British. We're fighting for Izzat. We're fighting for the honor of our regiment and the ashes of our fathers. Then the Afghans, and let me state here, the Afghans were very honorable in their conduct. They told the Sikhs, leave the fort, take gold, take money, take land, and take our good wishes, leave. And Havalda Rishar Singh, the head of those 21 Sikhs, he said only one thing. He says, with what face will I go back to my village? With what face am I going to go back and tell my father and my wife that I turned my back and ran away? What happens to the honor of the regiment? What happens to the honor of the Paltan? The unit was 34th Battalion of the Sikh Regiment, which is now redesignated as 4th Battalion of the Sikh Regiment. The Afghans attacked, and they attacked day and night, one by one. The Sikhs started dying. The last Sikh was a young soldier. He was 19 years of age. And he was the one who was signaling with that equipment. He was the one who was telling both Fort Havelock and Fort Golistan that we need reinforcements. Come, help us. And they said there are no reinforcements to give. There is nobody. It will take time. Hold on, hold on. During this entire confusion, the Afghans set fire to that fort. When they set fire to the fort, and when almost 
17 or 18 soldiers amongst the 21 Sikhs had died. That young signaler, that young 19-year-old boy soldier, he asked permission from his officer in Fort Havelock. He said, sir, can I now join the battle? The permission was given. And look at the spirit of the soldier. Look at the spirit of the soldier. He knew that he was going to die. And in that moment, he packed his equipment beautifully into the leather case. Look at his mindset. He takes out the mirror. He takes out all the equipment. He packs it beautifully into the leather case. He keeps it near a cupboard. And then he takes out his sword and he jumps. The fort is on fire. The fort is on fire. And while this person is fighting the, fighting the Afghans with just a sword, surrounded by thousands of Afghans, his body is on fire. His skin, his turban, his hair, everything is aflame. He's screaming and he's fighting. All 21 died. That night, all 21 died. This is the story of Saragari. This is the microsome. This is the DNA of the Indian army. And if I were to describe the DNA of the Indian army in three words, I would say, Izzat, Vafadari, Dastur. Honor, loyalty, and tradition. This is how the Indian army has always functioned. There's a small story of 1971 war where 52 of the enemy soldiers were killed in Jaisalmer. I'm sure all of you must have heard about the Battle of Longewala. The famous movie Border was made on the Battle of Longewala. Now, when the Pakistanis attacked, they were pushed back. They were pushed back by Indian Army soldiers. One officer and 51 other ranks died near a border pillar. And when they died, they were buried with full military honors and a guard of honor was given to the enemy soldiers. And when they were asked, why did you do that? Because the enemy would never do that. They said, ye Indian army hai. Dushmani mein bhi sharafat honi chahiye. This is the essence of the Indian army. And what can we learn from the Indian army as an institution? It's fascinating. This is perhaps the only institution it is perhaps the only institution that speaks not about rights, but about duty. Not about haq, but about farz. And I think this is the biggest battle that India is facing today by people who ask simply for rights. And rights are important. Of course, rights are important in every civilized society. But more important is your duty. Because in the Indian Army, they believe that if you do your duty, rights will follow. You don't have to ask for your rights. You should be willing to defend, stand up for what you believe is right. I often quote this, and I've said it on stage so many times. There is a beautiful Quranic Hadith, and it says, Paradise is under the shade of swords. What does this mean? This means that if this country is paradise, you must be willing to defend this country by violence. No country, no idea can be defended with peace. If you say that I'm going to defend this nation with peace, it is a lie. It cannot be done. You are flanked by two nuclear powers. You've gone to war with both these nuclear powers. And both these powers mean us harm. You cannot defend this country by peace. It has to be defended by violence. It has to be defended by strong men with guns who are willing to fight for you and me because we cannot fight for ourselves. The second thing, discipline. Not all of us are talented. This great Indian painter, M.F. Hussain, I'm sure all of you have heard about M.F. Hussain. M.F. Hussain would walk into the Rashpati Bhavan barefoot. He would walk into a five-star hotel barefoot. Why? Because the man was pure genius. But if you and I st uh, started to do this, people would not let us enter. There are only 0.001% of us who are of that caliber of M.F. Hussain. And for those of us who are not of the caliber of an M.F. Hussain, let us understand that life can only make you successful if you're disciplined. What does it mean? Small little things, small little things. Get up on time. Make your bed. Speak to people with respect. Do stuff properly so that people who come after you can figure out what you've already done and take your mission forward. Discipline.
extremely important. And third, this concept of morality. Now, what is the concept of morality in the Indian Army? It's very simple. The Army had a coffee table book, 2018. And in that coffee table book of 2018, I saw a painting of Lord Rama. And I asked a very senior army officer whose name I will not take. I said, sir, what is the meaning of having a painting of Lord Ram on an army coffee table book? And he tells me that, Gaurav, there have been kings far more powerful than Lord Ram in India. There has been Ashoka the Great. There has been Chandragupta Maurya. So many kings who had bigger armies whose military exploits can never be forgotten. But why do we worship Ram? We worship him because he was a moral king. We worship him because he is India's moral compass, an ideal son, an ideal husband, an ideal king, an ideal father. Which is why I always say, when I speak anywhere, when I go and I speak about the Indian army, I say that the Indian army is not just a powerful army, it's also a moral army. We are not strong because we have weapons. We are strong because we are right. And in that morality is our strength. I told you about giving a burial to 52 enemy soldiers. I told you about Dushmani Me Sharafat. All these things are ingrained in the DNA of the Indian Army. This is how this army functions. I end my talk by telling you again a small story. I've told you a story of Saragadi, 1897, where 21 Sikhs died fighting 10,000 Afghans. I'll tell you a story of a few years back, Kashmir. Five terrorists of the Jaish-e Muhammad and the Hezbollah Mujahideen had taken over the EDI building outside Srinagar. There were almost 150 hostages. The Jammu and Kashmir police came, they freed all the hostages. The Indian army was supposed to go inside and kill the terrorists. But they had a doubt in their mind. Could there be civilians inside? Are we going to be killing innocent people if we go inside? So rather than bomb the building, because that is what the Israelis would have done, that is what the Americans would have done, but not the Indian Army. Two officers with their team went inside to engage the terrorists. After one hour, two dead bodies came outside. Captain pa uh, Tushar Mahajan, 9 Para SF, and Captain Pawan Kumar, 10 Para SF. These two officers lost their lives. And they went inside with a secret, which I will tell you today, which will tell you why I call this a moral army. One of the people, or one of the persons they went to rescue inside was the eldest son of Sayyid Salahuddin, the head of the United Jihad Council and the chairman of Hezbollah Mujahideen. They knew that a UN-designated terrorist son was inside, and yet, they put their lives on the line because they felt that a father's sin should not be visited upon the son. This is the morality of the Indian Army. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what we must learn from the Indian Army. Victory and defeat keep on happening in this life. But always remember why Lord Ram is worshipped in India. He's worshipped not because he was the most powerful king. He was worshipped because, and he's worshipped to till date, to this date, because he was a moral king. He remains our compass. He remains the compass for all of us, irrespective of religion. We call him Maryada Purushottam. We call him the best amongst men, which is why morality or officer-like qualities are so deeply ingrained in the DNA of the Indian Army. That is what they teach us in the academy. That is what they tell us. You know, this is how you're supposed to behave. When we do something wrong, we are told, Officers of the Indian Army don't behave like this. This is conduct unbecoming of an officer of the Indian Army. This is the DNA that we must take back with us. Thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. Jai Hind. Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit CITTI.net. Dhanavad, Namaskar.